The rewards for ambition are bountiful here in the beautiful Southern California sun. Welcome to Miss Mojo, and today we're counting down our picks for the top 20 dark truths about classic Hollywood actors. Hit movie. Come on, you've got everything you want. For this list, we'll be looking at the golden age of Hollywood's most tragic and scandalous open secrets. Which of these dark truths shocked you the most? Let us know in the comments. Number 20, Merle Oberon hid her true ethnicity. Actress Merle Oberon was incredibly talented and widely known for her beauty. Madame Bernadotte, we haven't seen you in some time. How is your family? Very well, Your Majesty. Unfortunately, like her contemporaries, Oberon's image and background were seemingly under intense scrutiny and control by her home studio. However, it was eventually revealed that Oberon, who we now know was born in India, was also massaging the details of her own background. That included concealing her ethnicity as a mixed-race woman. She chose to stay quiet about her identity, reportedly to avoid Hollywood's racism. It wasn't until she passed away that the truth of her parentage and heritage ultimately came to light. I beg that in your graciousness you grant your sister's requests. So that we may get on with this rehearsal. Number 19, Gene Kelly's mistreatment of Debbie Reynolds. For the joy and tap dancing, making Singing in the Rain was no picnic. It takes a lot of pain to create that much fun on screen. It was, uh, I had blood in my shoes and uh, it was very difficult to do those numbers uh, as fast as they wanted them and as long as they wanted them, over and over and over and over. In fact, Debbie Reynolds would later liken it to childbirth. It didn't help that her male lead, dancer, actor, director extraordinaire, Gene Kelly, was horrific to her on set. He criticised her dancing at every turn, and she was left in tears. It didn't end with the dancing either. When the actor, who was two decades her senior, unexpectedly tongue-kissed her during a scene, she was left feeling shaken. Even Kelly apparently acknowledged his behaviour later, reportedly saying it was a wonder Reynolds still spoke to him. Good morning. Good morning. We've talked the whole night through. Good morning. Good morning to you. Number 18, The Misfits Curse. By all accounts, the making of this 1961 Western was a gruelling experience for all involved. Did I make the whistle? Almost, boy. You done good, though. But sadly, what happened to its three leads has enhanced the Misfits' reputation as a cursed movie. At the time, Marilyn Monroe's personal life was not in the best place, and both she and Montgomery Clift were dealing with substance use disorder. Clark Gable, for his part, passed away days after shooting was completed. Monroe would pass the next year, and Cliff would make three more movies, one of which came out posthumously before his death at the age of 45. Despite this, many modern critics cite The Misfits as career best work for the three stars. Honey, we all gotta go sometime, reason or no reason. Dying's as natural as living. Number 17, Joan Crawford removed her teeth. Who are you, please? I'm a stenographer. Many of us have our own insecurities about our physical appearance, and celebrities are no exception, especially the women who have societal expectations on them that men often don't have to deal with in the same way. And these expectations and insecurities can sometimes lead to rather extreme measures being taken to attempt to enhance one's appearance. And by my count, you're missing six molars? Extractions. What kind of medieval dental practice extracts six teeth without putting in implants? An example of which is Joan Crawford removing her teeth. No, she didn't take them all out, but in her early 20s, she did remove some of her back molars in an effort to accentuate her cheekbones. My agent told me if I wanted to work past 25, I should invest in a set of cheekbones. Number 16, The Conqueror Deaths. The cast of this misbegotten 1956 epic starring John Wayne as the titular conqueror, Genghis Khan, faced tragedy. There are moments for wisdom, Jamuga, then I listen to you. And there are moments for action, then I listen to my blood. I feel this Tartar woman is for me. Indeed, a little under half the artists who worked on The Conqueror developed some form of cancer. Wayne, co-stars such as Susan Hayward and Agnes Moorhead, director Dick Powell and many others would eventually pass away as a result of the disease. 
Many attribute this abnormally large number of the movie being filmed near where extensive nuclear tests had taken place in Utah. Whether it was radiation or any number of complicating factors, the story is a heartbreaking one. Before that picture was made, I did the same scene in real life. It's 12 years ago. Cost me a piece of lung. Number 15, Judy Garland's Terminated Pregnancies. Studio stars were beholden to a very strict set of rules and regulations. If they wanted to work, their lives were basically at the mercy of the studio. Hey, she's having the same as me. Orders from upstairs. Sorry. Few knew this better than Judy Garland. Much has been made of her time at MGM, when she, and possibly Mickey Rooney, were allegedly fed pills that would contribute to their substance use disorders. But there's more. Garland's pregnancy in 1941 reportedly angered studio chiefs, but it also troubled her domineering mother, Ethel. Together, Ethel and the studio had Garland terminate the pregnancy. Garland would endure a similar scenario only two years later, after becoming pregnant by actor Tyrone Power. We pay you a great deal of money. You have an image to maintain. And you owe it to us to maintain it. Number 14, the story of Peg Entwistle. When it was first built in 1923, the Hollywood sign was just a promotional tool for a new real estate development in the growing industry town. Its now mythical status may sadly have been helped along by a troubling event. A looking kid like you, you think you just gotta show up and poof, you're a movie star, huh? Well, that ain't how it works. Peg Entwistle was a successful stage actress who eventually ended up in Hollywood for a play and went on to try her hand at films. She made 13 Women, which would end up being a posthumous release, as well as her first and only movie credit. Edits reportedly left most of her performance on the cutting room floor, and RKO cut ties with her. In 1932, she made her way atop the H of the Hollywood Land sign, and sadly took her own life. Responsible, it was Kay's part, it was Kay's life, but now it's too late. Kay is dead. Number 13, George Reeves passing. Although he was in many movies, George Reeves found his biggest success on television. For six seasons, the actor portrayed the dual role of Clark Kent and Superman in Adventures of Superman. I, I can't remember any, anything after they jumped me in the cave. If I'd come two minutes later, you'd been food for the fishes. Unfortunately, Reeves passed away in 1959 due to a gunshot wound. Though it was ruled as self-inflicted, the presence of things like mysterious bruises and extra bullets at the scene sent rumours swirling. Different theories spread to explain the death that pinned the blame on everyone from his fiance to the husband of a lover. The case and its puzzling circumstances have been fodder for true crime enthusiasts ever since. It remains one of classic Hollywood's biggest mysteries. Number 12, the murder of Lana Turner's mobster lover. Glamorous MGM star Lana Turner was no stranger to publicity, but the 1958 murder of her abusive lover, Johnny Stompanato, brought the media scrutiny to new heights. Johnny. Bob. Johnny. I'm not Johnny. During a violent argument between the two, Turner's daughter, Cheryl Crane, killed Stompanato in what was ruled as an act of justifiable homicide. The ensuing trial and media circus was the stuff of Hollywood melodrama. It was all made especially poisonous because Turner's emotional testimony didn't do much to quell suspicions. She committed the crime, and was letting her daughter take the fall. Despite vicious gossip, the two never wavered from the official version of events. I didn't come to bother you, or you won't. Not ever again. Number 11, the Fatty Arbuckle Trials. Stories of backstage botchery fueled the national scandal involving Roscoe Fatty Arbuckle, who was accused of the assault and manslaughter of star Virginia Rappé. Fame and glory, and then the all too human uh, tragedies that often wipe them out. The young silent film actress passed away in 1921 of a ruptured bladder and peritonitis mere days after becoming sick at a soiree of his. The illness was alleged to have been a result of an attack by the comedian. After three trials, Arbuckle was exonerated, but the public's perception of him was irrevocably changed. 
The circumstances surrounding Rapé's death became obscured by rumour, many of which were popularised in Kenneth Anger's highly exaggerated book, Hollywood Babylon. Oh my gosh, uh, I, I don't think I, I should talk to you news fellows anymore. Number 10. Shirley Temple was almost assassinated. Well, I eat watermelon and I have four years sing Polly Wally Doodle Holiday. Shirley Temple was one of the great child stars in the history of Hollywood. She was also the target of an assassination attempt when she was young. So if the one you idolize is near you, a song of love will help you find the way. The perpetrator of the attempt was a sad and emotionally distraught woman who'd lost her daughter, supposedly at the same time that Temple was born. In her sorrow, the woman came to believe that Temple had stolen her daughter's soul and that targeting her would release it from her. The woman took out a gun during a live performance but was stopped before she could fire it. It's a sad story all around that thankfully ended without any physical harm to Temple. On the good ship, lollipop, it's a sweet trip to a candy shop. Later in life, the star was vocal about her experience with a predatory MGM producer. We got in the car driving home. I said, Mom, you won't believe what happened to me. Number nine, Montgomery Cliff's life-changing car accident. A beautiful girl will place a garland of oak leaves on my sun-colored locks. I'd like to be that girl. Known for his roles in such films as A Place in the Sun and From Here to Eternity, Montgomery Clift was a big Hollywood star in the late 40s and 50s, until a car accident changed his life. Clift was filming Raintree County when, following a dinner party at co-star Elizabeth Taylor's house, Clift crashed his car into a telephone pole. Thankfully, Taylor arrived to help save his life. The accident required plastic surgery and two months of recovery before the actor could finish the film. Besides the changes to his appearance, the accident led to Clift turning to substances to dull the pain. He continued to make movies, but he was never really the same until he died at 45. You seem so strange, so deep and far away. So you were holding something back. Number eight, Stan Laurel's drinking. The comedy duo of Stan Laurel and Oliver Hardy brought joy and laughter to so many people throughout the first half of the 20th century. What are you doing? I'm talking to you. What do you think I'm doing? But one person who wasn't laughing was Vera Shivalova. Shivalova was Laurel's third wife and the recipient of some very scary threats from the beloved comic performer. Supposedly, Laurel had a problem with alcohol and needless to say, he wasn't a friendly drunk. Watch what you are doing! When the couple divorced, Shivalova made some very serious accusations, claiming that her husband had threatened her with a gun and even had dug a grave in their backyard, telling her that he was going to bury her alive. Nothing funny about that. Your money or your life? What? Your money or your life? Number seven, allegations against Joan Crawford. Joan Crawford is widely regarded as one of the old Hollywood greats. Look, you might as well know it now, both of you. Your father and I have decided to separate. You mean Dad's not coming home anymore? Doesn't he like us? Oh, it has nothing to do with you, honey. But her daughter Christina Crawford's memoirs, namely Mummy Dearest, painted a distressing picture of life behind the scenes. In it, Joan was described as someone with alcohol use disorder who was violent and overall abusive. As you can imagine, the book and its claims were a lightning rod for controversy upon publication. The rest of Joan Crawford's daughters and several of her Hollywood contemporaries, including foe Betty Davis, denied the allegations. Through all the criticism, controversy and anger, however, Christina Crawford has stood by her story. Why can't you give me the respect that I'm entitled to? Number six, John Huston's vehicular manslaughter. John Huston's path to becoming one of the greatest directors of all time began in 1941 with his directorial debut, The Maltese Falcon. What is it? The uh, stuff that dreams are made of. However, prior to getting his shot at directing, Huston spent the beginning and the end of the 1930s as a writer in Hollywood. What about the middle years? Well, Huston spent those wandering around Europe 
following the death of actress Tosca Rulian, a death that he caused while driving intoxicated. Although somehow a coroner's jury did exonerate Houston of any blame. There was a rumor that Clark Gable was the one that killed Rulian, and Houston was paid to take the fall. See, Mr. Gitz, most people never have to face the fact that the right time and the right place, they're capable of anything. But given that Gable was elsewhere filming a movie at the time, the rumor doesn't appear to have any legs. I can manage well enough horizontally, but vertically I fall apart. Number five, Marilyn's stuttering began after childhood trauma. A number of famous actors dealt with stuttering as children, including, as fans of The Big Bang Theory know, James Earl Jones. Is it true, as a child, you were a stutterer and were functionally mute for eight years? It is true. But while people may be familiar with many of Marilyn Monroe's life struggles, did you know that she too stuttered growing up? I play the ukulele and I sing too. Sings too? <laughs> well, I don't have much of a voice, but then... This isn't much of a band. Many biographies have covered this fact, and Monroe herself talked about it in interviews. It got so bad at times that she, like other stutterers, was so scared and embarrassed that she basically stopped talking for extended periods. How exactly it started is obviously up for debate, but many biographers have attributed it to trauma of living with her mother, who lived with schizophrenia, and her childhood in and out of foster care and orphanages. First time was at the orphanage, and then later in my teens, I stuttered. Number four, Marlon Brando's treatment towards Rita Moreno. Marlon Brando and Rita Moreno were first acquainted in 1954. Like often happens in Hollywood, they started dating. I just wanted to know where you were last night. There's no denying Brando's brilliance as one of the greatest actors of all time. However, when it came to women, Moreno called him a bad guy. Besides the lying and cheating and bursts of rage, Moreno also revealed that Brando made plans for her to terminate a pregnancy while they were together, though it was dangerously performed and could have ended in disaster for her. It was all too much for the young actress, who has also been open about how the relationship led to her almost taking her life. That's how I tried to do it, and it really was an attempt to do that. Number three, Hitchcock stalked his own actress. Besides a small, uncredited role in 1950, Tippi Hedren made her big screen debut in, in Alfred Hitchcock's 1963 film, The Birds, and followed it up next year in Hitchcock's Marnie. If you don't mind, I'd like to go to bed. You'd think that after having such success with such a great director, that the two would have worked together again, but they never did. Although it wasn't because Hitchcock didn't like Hedren, but rather because he liked her too much. I started noticing that um, uh, he kept watching me, staring at me. The great director became obsessed with Hedren, and her time on both films was filled with emotional and mental mistreatment and unwanted advances from Hitchcock. From isolating her from the rest of the cast by forbidding any of them to talk to her, to demanding she be sexually available to him, which she refused. I became very, very good at getting out. I, always, I would always have somewhere to go, had to be somewhere, had something to do. Number two, Chaplin's younger spouses. Charlie Chaplin made over 80 movies. That's a lot. However, it pales in comparison to the number of people he slept with, a number that he claimed was over 2,000. And while we don't know the ages of all of them, the ones we do know make us, shall we say, uncomfortable. He married his first wife, Mildred Harris, in 1918. Chaplin was 29, and Harris was only 16. Chaplin felt forced into marrying his second wife, Lita Gray, when the 35-year-old icon discovered that the 16-year-old Gray was pregnant. In 1943, at the age of 54, Chaplin married for the fourth and last time. His wife, Una O'Neill, was 18. But the couple have eight kids and remained together until Chaplin's passing in 1977. Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. Number one. Judy Lewis was the secret child of a huge star. 
Soap opera actress Judy Lewis's life sounds like the script from an episode of afternoon television. I wish you hadn't. Why not? Oh, I haven't let myself think about that. I didn't dare. But it isn't. Lewis's mother was actress Loretta Young, and her biological father was Clark Gable. However, Gable was married at the time, so attempting to avoid a scandal, Young hid her pregnancy and placed her baby into orphanages when she was born. After 19 months, Young adopted her daughter back, but her stunning resemblance to Gable meant that most of Hollywood knew the truth. Well, the first time I knew who my father was, I was 23 and I was two weeks away from being married. Young even had a seven-year-old Lewis get her ears pinned back in order to try and hide the similarities. Eventually, Young admitted the truth to her daughter and claimed that she wasn't conceived consensually. It wasn't until I was 31 that I finally did ask my mother and did hear the truth from her. But by that time, my father had died. 